Francis Freed as the full fury of America's mighty war effort is unleashed. Shattered Nazi armies fall back in disorder and confusion, leaving blazing equipment of shell-torn towns as General Patton's Third Army dashes through France toward the Rhine. Closer and closer to Berlin, the tide of battle flows. Nazi officers, beaten and battle-crazed, are captured. General Eisenhower's brilliant strategy pinches off entire enemy divisions. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Armies, triumphantly enters Paris. One of his first official acts is to pay homage at the tomb of the unknown soldier as the Garde Militaire, symbol of France reborn, presents arms in salute, and the liberated France rejoices. An historic moment, the vanguard of the American army smashes to the Siegfried Line, invading Western Germany for the first time since Napoleon. Far behind the Nazi lines, 8th and 9th Air Force pilots hit where it hurts. Enemy communications are torn to pieces by American artillery and daring flyers who dominate the skies over Germany. Aachen, first German city to be invaded by Allied army. The Nazi garrison stubbornly refuses to surrender. The destruction of Aachen begins. The ancient capital of Charlemagne's empire is won street by street as the Yanks relentlessly press the attack. Finally, a signal surrender, and the city is taken. General Eisenhower, with characteristic simplicity, appears in the front lines to personally commend his G.I. Joes for exploits in battle. Now the weather begins to slow the attack. Rains and floods make progress increasingly difficult bogging down heavy equipment, flooding city streets, and slowing up the Allied advance. The bitter cold and mounting snows handicap the Allied army. Thus the weather becomes a major factor in determining when the Nazis can be beaten into unconditional surrender. British armies slash through the heart of Belgium, outflanking thousands of Germans along the coast. Great events occur after the German debacle and collapse in Normandy. Brussels is taken, and in the Belgian capital, the fall of a hated symbol brings a new hope into the hearts of liberated nations. The joyous people unleash all their pent-up hatred against their Nazi conquerors. This expresses the nation's emotion. Mammoth Armada of C-47s and code gliders disgorges the first Allied airborne army along the Rhine Delta. While from the sea, daring Canadians storm the last gate guarding Antwerp. And other commando units drive inland toward Flushing to seize the Scheldt Estuary. The invading Canadians and British experience the most savage fighting of the war during the terrific battle to free the port of Antwerp. But even with time out for compassion, they win the city. A brief moment of peace. In St. Peter's at Rome, Pope Pius creates an historic occasion for Allied soldiers. The apostolic blessing for all, no matter of what creed. And as the status gestatoria moves slowly in recessional through the crowded aisle, men of every faith press forward to receive personal blessing and to touch the apostolic ring. Russia's mighty armies make new history on the Eastern Front, knocking Romania out of the war, joining with Yugoslav partisans to sweep through Belgrade, tying down huge Nazi forces in Hungary, and finally on the north, invading East Prussia, 
home of the war-making Junkers. Captured German news films reveal the retreating Nazis desperately attempting to slow down the advancing Russian army by demolishing railroad tracks, warehouses, and supply dumps. In Moscow, the enormous extent of Soviet victories in 1944 is partly seen in the spectacular parade of 60,000 Nazi prisoners marching through the city streets and historic Red Square to prison camps nearby. The Marines of Landis, and it's a traditional story repeated over and over again, this time in the Marianas, in the battle for vital Saipan. Here is some of the fiercest fighting ever photographed by daring cameramen. Flamethrowers smoke out the frantic chats. Dyers want to fire. The Marianas are 1,500 miles from Japan. The island becomes a base for B-29 super fortresses to bomb Tokyo. The Marines are alert when a battle-crazed Jap surrenders. The fight for Saipan increases in fury. Many Nippon soldiers are relentlessly driven back to the top of the cliff, where they commit suicide by leaping to the jagged rocks below. Marianas fall to our fighting Marines. Six hundred assault ships sail to make history. General Douglas MacArthur aboard the cruiser Nashville watches the naval attack. Bypassing Mindanao, he catches the enemy in the Philippines completely off balance by landing on Leyte. More than 100,000 men of the 6th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Walter Krugar, come ashore. Making good his immortal promise, I will return, MacArthur comes ashore with President Sergio Osmina and every living member of the ill-fated garrison who escaped with him from Corregidor. Two years and ten months later, American troops smash inland against the Jap 16th Division, conquerors of Bataan, and perpetrators of the horrible March of Death. From the steps of the capital in Tacloban, President Osmena again calls the Philippine patriots to arms. Gun crews on the alert to battle Hitler's flying bombs. They succeed in shooting down 1,500 out of 8,000 one-ton robots. Fighting planes bring down 1,900 more. An average of 100 a day threaten England. One-third of the Nazi secret weapons reach British targets, killing 6,000 people, seriously wounding 17,000 others. British and American gunners perform magnificently. There's a robot, detected and diving to the ground. A warning of new horrors in any future war. New York's governor, Thomas E. Dewey, campaigns for the presidency with the oft-repeated slogan, It's time for a change. In the final days of the campaign, Franklin D. Roosevelt swings into his fight for a fourth term. As the world watches with amazement, a nation strong enough to take time out for politics in the midst of the greatest war in history. By a majority of three and a half million votes, Delano Roosevelt is elected to serve for a fourth term. 